Hello, people. Today we have another episode, episode of our uh, series on the, the matter with the great researcher. And today the great researcher is Dan Haramati, and he's going to talk about entity-centric reverse transform learning for object manipulation from pixels. Hi, Dan. Please, the stage is yours. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Dan Aramadi. I'm a graduate student in the Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, uh, advised by Professor Aviv Tamar. And I'll be presenting our work, uh, Entity-Centric Reinforcement Learning for Object Manipulation from Pixels, uh, which was uh, done with Tal Daniel and Aviv Tamar, and accepted to ICLR 2024 as a spotlight. So our paper deals uh, with the task of multi-object manipulation. This is a challenging multitask problem, requires long horizon planning while accounting for the relationships and interactions between the entities in the environment. And examples for such as are one example you can see here is a robotic tabletop manipulation where a robotic arm uh, needs to push uh, cubes to a goal configuration specified by this image on the right. Um, other examples of tasks are operating in a kitchen environment or a warehouse arrangement. Uh, but generally, these um, these challenges apply to more general problems, maybe also to autonomous vehicles, where um, in autonomous driving, you need to account for multiple entities in your environment, could be other vehicles, people crossing the road, and other obstacles, and so forth. So deep reinforcement learning is a promising approach to solve these kinds of problems, given a suitable state representation. So it is useful to consider a factorized state space where the entire state of the system factorizes into the states of the individual entities. So if we take the example of the tabletop manipulation, the entities would be the objects, uh, the cubes on the table, and our agent. And if I want to describe the state of our system, the, the order in which I describe the locations of the cubes, for example, does not matter, right? If I say where the red cube is and then the green cube, it doesn't matter doesn't change if I describe where the uh, green cube is before the red cube. So really this factorization of the state space and treating the state as a set of states helps us deal with the combinatorial complexity of uh, the state space in these kinds of tasks. Now, acquiring this factorized state space um, when dealing with ground truth state observations, typically only available in simulation, is a pretty trivial task because each uh, individual state is maintained separately. But when working from images, acquiring this factorized state is not at all trivial. And in addition, when we're working with images, um, this also introduces partial observability to our problem. So as you can see here, some objects are occluded while the, um, the robotic arm is manipulating. So um, previous work, um, proposed solving um, goal-conditioned multi-object manipulation tasks. I'm sorry, Dan. May, yes. Sorry, Dan. May I ask a quick question? This factorization yeah, of the state space, is it something that you learn or you assume that it's given? So it depends. From images, you would need to learn this because it's not given to you, but it's something you aspire to. You would either need to learn it somehow or it could be given in the simulation. It's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Because you have the states of each object. So you could just need to... Um, represent it as a set instead of representing it, for example, as a single vector of a concatenation of states. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no problem, thanks. Okay, perfect. So as I said, previous work um, um, considered multi-object manipulation goal, uh, goal condition test um, from ground truth state observations um, and used model-free reinforcement learning to solve these tests, specifically, um, they used uh, off-policy uh, actor-critic algorithms such as SAC or TD3, um, and they considered a factorized state space and proposed using uh, attention-based networks to process these states um, for the policy and Q function neural networks. So if we take a look at the natural entities in these kinds of tests, we have our agent, the states of the objects, the states of the corresponding goals. And we also have the action, which we will treat as an entity since it is also an input of uh, the Q function. 
So previous work defined an entity or an input token to the attention-based network in the following way. It is a concatenation of the agent, the object, its corresponding goal, and in the case of the Q function, also the action. And there are a few assumptions that go into this um, choice of structure. The first assumption is that you can um, identify the agent out of all of your entities. Now, when working with uh, ground truth state, this is a trivial task, but uh, if you're working from images, this would require some kind of supervision. Another assumption that is being made here is that you can easily match between objects and their corresponding goals. Now, when working from images, matching is not necessarily an easy task, and there's also not um, always a one-to-one -one match between objects and goals uh, due to, for example, occlusion. So our approach is to treat each natural entity in our problem as a separate input to our attention-based network, and then learn which entity is the agent and the relationships between objects and goals as part of the RL training. All right. So another line of uh, previous work considered the same setting, just learning from directly from pixels. So instead of state observations, we have image observations. Rig proposed uh, representing states and goals as single latent vectors uh, acquired with a beta variational autoencoder. Now, this unstructured representation in the form of a single latent vector representing the image uh, failed to scale to environments with more than a single object. Small, which is a work uh, most closely related to our own, proposed using object-centric representation of images. Specifically, they use the object-centric representation model, Scalo, which learns to extract and affected representations of images um, and they use the scalar encoder to uh, extract this representation both from state images and goal images, and then learn to solve single goals um, out of this uh, goal space. Uh, they choose a specific goal out of the um, factorized uh, state that they required and learn to achieve that sub, uh, that sub goal. And then during inference, they um, solve sequentially um, for each sub goal, assuming independence of sub goals. Now, a major limitation of this approach is that it assumes that subgoals are independently reachable. And this limits um, uh, this approach from solving tasks where it is necessary to model the relationships between objects to achieve such goals. And we will give examples for this uh, later on. So uh, our main contribution is a goal-conditioned deep reinforcement learning framework for multi-object manipulation from pixels. And our method is comprised of two main components. Our first component is an object-centric representation of images. We choose to use the deep latent particles model, which is essentially a, a variational autoencoder with a structured latent space consisting of a set of latent uh, vectors called particles. Uh, the second component is the entity interaction transformer. It is a transformer-based architecture that we use to model the policy and queue function networks. And um, it uh, takes the object-centric representations of images as input. Now, different from previous work, our EIT is structured so that it can model relationships between goals and state entities, as well as entity-entity interaction in the current state. And also, it does not require any explicit matching between entities in different images, enabling us to incorporate multi-view inputs seamlessly, which we found to be crucial for uh, sample-efficient learning. All right. So before we get into the details of each one of these components, I would like to start with um, a general reasoning that underlies uh, our approach. So an, an important note here is that the representation learning problem, so the learning of the object-centric representation of images, and the decision-making problem, the reinforcement learning using the entity interaction transformer, are both dependent problems, separate but dependent. And I would like to start by talking about um, what attributes we may require from our image representation, our object-centric representation. So ideally, 
we would like our representation to capture the entire physical physical state of the system. So the physical state of each entity, such as the robot and the objects. Um, the problem with that is that it generally is not feasible. For example, attributes such as mass cannot be inferred from uh, only from images without any prior knowledge. So another set of attributes we must require are dynamic related attributes, dynamics related such as uh, velocity, or even understanding the fact that the robot is a single entity with several degrees of freedom is something that can't be inferred from images alone. So um, acquiring dynamics related attributes would require us to learn um, a representation that operates on sequences of images or videos. And this is generally um, more complicated to acquire. We would, might also want our um, representation to have task related attributes, for example, the color, shape, and orientation of objects may only be important for the task if they are somehow related to the goals we are trying to reach, right? And if you want our, our representation to incorporate these task-related attributes, we must train it with a loss that is somehow task-aware, or at least train it on data that is task-specific. And both of these are not necessarily, um, we won't necessarily have them, or not necessarily easy to acquire. Another thing we might want to want is uh, want to incorporate is 3D related attributes. So when we consider robotic manipulation, we're basically operating in a, a, a real world, a 3D world, but we're learning from 2D image observations. So we might want our um, representation to somehow encompass position and orientation in 3D space or 3D shape. And this can be learned maybe using depth cameras or um, NERFs, for example. But these are also uh, more complicated um, to acquire. So our approach is to learn a lean object-centric representation and a very expressive decision maker, which is our entity interaction transform. And this allows for two things. It allows us to easily acquire an object-centric representation. So we train the deep latent particles model on an unsupervised objective and on data collected by a random policy. So it's not is not aware of the task. It's, we also train it on single images, so it's also not aware of the dynamics, does not need to learn or understand anything about the dynamics of the environment. And we delegate the understanding of anything task-related, dynamics, and generally 3D perception. We delegate this to our entity interaction transform. And this allows us to handle multiple viewpoints and uh, be robust to state goal mismatches. All right, so if we don't have any questions, I'll continue to describe uh, the individual components uh, I presented earlier. All right. Yeah, we're so, fine, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, the first component is the object-centric representation. As I mentioned, we use the deep latent particles model, which is a VAE with a structured latent space, which represents each image by a set of latent particles, each represented by a single latent vector, each particle. So we have um, certain explicit attributes to describe these particles. We have um, a position attribute, which is a position in pixel space, xy coordinates in pixel space. We have an xy scale attributes. We also have a depth attribute, which is not actually depth, but it uh, tells us which object is in front of the other in the image. We also have a transparency attribute and a set of visual latent attributes that encode the visual appearances of a glimpse around each particle. As you can see in this figure here, these are glimpses of uh, around locations of particles describing different objects in, uh, in this scene. So we use the DLP model, the DLP encoder to extract factorized representations of images of both states and goals. We do this for states and goals from multi-view, from multiple views. So we use multi-view perception. And we pre-train this deep latent particles model with data collected by a random policy. Now, to show some visualization of what this looks like, what this representation looks like, and how the agent perceives the environment, the top image, the image here on the top right is an overview of uh, the environments we consider in our experiments. We have 
um, a robotic uh, a panda robot arm manipulating um, cubes on on a tabletop environment. Uh, I'm sorry, then. Yes. I'm sorry, then. Quick question. Uh, yeah. Here, the particles and the objects are the same thing? So not exactly. As you can see in this visualization, the key points here, they visualize um, the locations of the particles that the DLP extracted. Now, you can see that we have sometimes multiple particles on each object. So here we have more particles in our presentation than objects, and our entity interaction transformer deals with this. So particles are not equivalent to objects, but they do represent objects. So for example, if we talk about it, like our natural entities, so um, the agent, for example, is a single natural entity, but it is represented by multiple particles. And is that possible that some objects will not be represented by uh, any particle at all? Well, generally, yes. But what we choose, uh, it's a design choice. We chose to, um, so the number of particles in the deep latent particles model is a hyperparameter. So we chose a very large number of particles because our entity interaction transformer is able to understand um, that uh, certain particles relate to the same object, but it would not be able to uh, understand re uh, reason about objects that are not captured by our DLP. So we basically, what we do is choose a large number of particles such that the probability that um, an object is not represented by at least one particle is very small. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. Great. So now we can move on to our entity interactions transform. So uh, the general um, um, structure of this, uh, of the architecture is a sequence of transformer blocks, followed by a multi-layer perceptron that outputs uh, the action in the case of the policy or the value in the case of the cube function. And there are several desired properties that motivated our design. The first thing we wanted to do is incorporate multiple viewpoints in a single transformer model. And to do this, we, in, we incorporated a view encoding, which is um, implemented by an additive learned encoding, where the um, additive encoding encodes the, um, the view um, which the particle came from. So we basically have two separate encodings for view number one and view number two in this case, and we do the same thing for the goal. The second thing we want to do is to have, to be able to condition on goals. So we um, use the cross attention mechanism uh, and we condition using cross attention. So we condition our um, state particles on the uh, goal particles. Now the difficulty in um, these two pro um, these two properties is that particles in different views don't necessarily match, and what this means is um, this matching needs to be learned. So we believe the attention mechanism is a strong inductive bias to learn these relationships between the different particles. Another thing we want is for the output of our network network to be invariant to permutation of the particles, right? We uh, describe our state as a set of particles, meaning the order is not important. Um, the order is not important to describe the state. Therefore, we want our output to be invariant to permutations in this order. So for that, um, we use um, the transformer blocks, which are permutation equivariant, followed by a permutation invariant operation, which is um, also an attention-based aggregation, which is then um, fed to an MLP for the final output. Now, two things that I want to mention here, two very important design choices was incorporating multiple views, which proved to be crucial for the RL agent to be able to construct an internal understanding of 3D dynamics from the 2D observations we provided it in a sample efficient manner. And the second uh, design choice was um, incorporating the action as a separate token, a separate entity into uh, as an input to the Q function. And this also proved to be a very uh, significant design choice, uh, which you can see in our ablation studies um, 
in the paper. Dan, I'm sorry, can I ask a question about this uh, this first part, this encoding? Uh, could you please elaborate more? So you have multiple views, which are continuous uh, type of objects, and then you somehow convert them to uh, tokens, which are like discrete. Uh, how did you how did you right. do that? So so the tokens aren't um, aren't actually discrete. What's discrete? The, the the values of the tokens are not discrete. So maybe you normally in language the inputs are discrete. You have a certain vocabulary vocabulary here. Um, the um, the attributes are the attributes that I detailed before. Of each latent particle has a set of um, continuous attributes. The only thing is that we treat each particle as a separate token. We, there is no discretization here. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. So you treat each particle as a separate token here. I see, okay. Right, but each particle can have a, a continuous um, distribution of features. And the view encoding is in order for the model to somehow, um, since there's no importance in, in order, and the order of the particles, we want to somehow incorporate information about the source of each particle, because we incorporate multiple views in a single transformer model. So we do this by adding a view identifying encoding. So the same encoding would be added to each particle in view one, and a different encoding would be added to each particle in view number two. And the same encoding added to views and part of uh, the particles in view one would also be added to the goals in view in the same view. Okay, I hope that was clear. Great. Yep. So, all right. So the final uh, property we would want from our model is to be able to generalize, and specifically to be able to have um, perform compositional generalization. And in our context, compositional generalization refers to the ability of our trained policy to um, be able to solve tasks with um, more a larger number of objects than it was trained on, or generally a different number of objects than it was trained on. And generally, we want to do this for our method to be able to scale to larger number of objects without necessarily uh, needing to train on um, a large amount of objects. So here uh, we define a notion of compositional generalization in RL and show that under sufficient conditions, uh, a self-attention based policy can obtain. So now I'm gonna summarize a theoretical a result that we, we present in our paper. So we consider an N object MDP with a factorized state space where the substate of each object belongs to the same space. And an assumption we make is that the optimal Q function can be written in the form of a self-attention function. And we believe this is a reasonable uh, assumption for tasks where the optimal policy involves a similar procedure uh, that must be applied to each object, such uh, which is the case in uh, the uh, in the task we considered in our uh, in our um, uh, experiments, uh, moving uh, blocks to certain uh, locations on the table. So, sorry, then quick quick question on this assumption: Did you have a chance to uh, validate maybe on the experiments like how 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 like how justified how practical they are? So I think what um, shows that this is a practical assumption is that we were able to solve the task while representing the Q function uh, in the form of a self attention function using our entity interaction transform. So the fact that you were able to solve this task is somehow a validation that this is a reasonable assumption. Mm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we assume that the optimal Q function can be represented as a self-attention function. And this is true for, and it is optimal for all N, so for every number of objects. So now we show that, um, Assume that we obtain an approximation of our Q function that is of the same structure as the optimal Q function. So it's also a self-attention, has a self-attention structure and that it is epsilon optimal up to M objects. So we are, we have a good approximation of our optimal Q function trained on up to M objects. Then we show that the suboptimality grows at most linearly in the number of objects. 
Now, what this implies is that a Q function trained on, for example, up to three objects is not very far from the optimal Q function for a large number of object, objects, for example, six objects. And what this means is that if we train a policy to maximize our approximated Q function, it would also achieve high returns under the optimal Q function for a larger number of objects. And this is basically a notion of compositional generalization in reinforcement learning. All right. So now we'll just move on to our results, see how um, our method uh, was able to deal with multi-object manipulation tasks. And for this, we present um, a suite of environments. Um, the first one is the n cubes environment. We have a different number of cubes. So here you see the six cubes environment. And we use this to test our method's ability to scale to uh, a training on increasing number of objects, but also generalizing from training to a certain number and generalizing to larger number of objects, zero shot. The second suite of environments are meant to test our method's ability to model um, relationships and interactions between objects. And for this, we design tasks that require modeling these interactions. So the first one is adjacent goals. It's basically the three cubes environment where the goals are always um, such that the objects are close to each other. And what this means is that the agent needs to understand the physical um, the, the uh, physical interaction between objects as to not push certain cubes away from their goals while manipulating others. Second environment is the ordered push environment. So here it's we have two cubes. And on this table, we also have a narrow corridor, which fits, uh, which fits only a single cube um, in its width. So here the agent needs to understand the ordered relationship of um, the objects and that also needs to understand the physical interaction between these objects because, for example, you can't put the red object first and then push the green object because then it would fail to reach either subgroup. And lastly, we introduce a small table environment, which is the same as the three cubes environment, except the, the table is significantly smaller. And in this case, the agent needs to account for all objects at all times as to not push uh, certain objects off the table. So to solve these tasks, the base reinforcement learning algorithm we use is TV3 and hindsight experience replay for goal relabeling. And um, for the training of the DLP, we pre-trained it on data collected by a random policy in the six cubes environment. And we found that it generalized well to uh, environments with less objects and also to uh, changing uh, backgrounds, for example, the small table. All right, so any questions about, about these environments before we see some results? All right. So the first results um, I want to show is how our method deals with an increasing number of objects. And we compare two, uh, two baselines. The first one is small in red, and the, sec the second one is an unstructured baseline where the state is represented as a single vector uh, using... Um, uh, the encoder of a beta variational autoencoder. So this is in green. And the dotted lines are each method using ground truth state observations. And the regular lines are um, the methods using uh, um, learning from images. So each method with its um, um, appropriate representation. And there are two things that I want to emphasize here. The first, what we see here are graphs for the success rate and solving um, um, success rate for solving the task as a function of the environment time steps it was trained on. So if we look at the green unstructured image baseline here, we see that for one object it is able to learn, but for an additional, for already one additional object, the success rates drop to nearly zero. So the unstructured representation fails to um, deal with the complexity of the increasing number of objects. Another thing I want to uh, attract your attention to is that our image-based representation on three objects performs better, so it learns faster and achieves higher performance than the unstructured state observations. And generally, learning from images is a much more difficult task. So here, this emphasizes the importance of structure in these kinds of problems and the inductive bias that is present in our method 
compared to the uh, lack of structure in the state-based method view. All right. And in terms of the results on interaction, so here we compare our method to um, the state-based small. And so small solves each subgoal independently, and it decides which subgoal to solve during inference randomly. So in the ordered push environment, um, we would generally expect um, an expectation for it to achieve a maximum of 50% success rate. And we see that it really achieves less than 50% success rate. So our image-based approach surpasses small in this setting. The small table environment, you see that our state-based approach surpasses small state-based, and but also our image-based um, um, method uh, achieves uh, comparable performance um, to the small state-based. And also in the adjacent goals, um, our state-based method surpasses small and so does our image-based method. So really what these results emphasize is that methods such as small, small that decompose the reinforcement learning problem to solve for individual objects is, um, is limited in solving a task which require um, modeling relationships between objects in order to solve the task. So to see some of the failure cases of small, here in the uh, small table, we see that small often uh, drops um, cubes on the table. In the adjacent goal environment, we can see our approach, uh, our method uh, performing on the left, it is able to, uh, to achieve the goal while small um, consistently pushes objects away from their goals while trying to manipulate uh, other objects to their goal. So eventually it fails to reach the, the overall goal. And lastly, for ordered push, we can see that our, uh, our method achieves 95% success rate. So it's able to learn the ordered relationship and the physical interaction between these two cubes while small um, often fails by trying to insert the red cube after it positions the, the green cube in the front of the corridor, and then it fails to reach either subgroup. Now, in terms of compositional generalization, we trained a policy, our image-based policy, on uh, three cubes and see how it, um, if it was able to generalize two an increasing number of objects. And here we see that it is able to generalize from training on three objects, zero shot to uh, six objects. And in another scenario we consider, we train on three objects. During inference, the goal is still represented by three objects, but in the environment, we place four objects of each color, totaling in 12 objects. And what we see here is that the agent learned a general a general behavior and is able to uh, manipulate each object to its corresponding goal with matching color. So it basically sorts the objects around each goal location. And we see these results as um, exceptional because they require compositional gen generalization from both our policy, which was trained on three objects and generalized to 12 objects, and from the uh, deep latent particles model, which was trained on six objects and generalizes to 12 objects. So some preliminary results on slightly different environment. So it's still a pushing environment. It, uh, it is, we call it push 2T. The agent is tasked to push two T-shaped blocks to a goal orientation. So the location here doesn't matter, only the orientation of the T, and they both need to be uh, pushed to the same goal orientation. Now, um, the success in this task shows the ability of our entity intera interaction transformer to both infer and accurately manipulate attributes that are not explicit in our latent representation. So to remind you how our latent representation looks like, the position um, is somehow explicit in our latent representation, at least in pixel space. But the orientation of the objects, it must infer these uh, um, this property from the latent visual attributes of each object. 
and is able to do so um, and uh, achieve success in this task. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. If you wanna see, um, uh, check out our paper, see additional videos and or see the code, which is uh, um, open source and publicly available. Uh, please check out our website and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you Dan for the wonderful talk. Um... Uh, I uh, I have a question and maybe you guys also will ask you uh, the questions after. So my question is, uh, I remember there's a paper that uses NORF for policy representation. They specifically, what they do is they do NORF and policy done in the latent space of NORF. Of North. Like, mm -hmm. did, did you have a chance to, to compare against that? Uh, why do you, like, is it better, worse? Can you say something on that? So I'm not sure I'm familiar um, with this work. Um, are they also use, um, manipulating, considered multi-object manipulation tasks? Yep. Okay, so I'm not really familiar to uh, familiar with this work. No, um, no so... problem. No, I, I think we could actually then send it to uh, to the link you like for, to oh, this work. Yes, please, please do. I'd be, I'd be yeah, yeah, no to, problem uh, to read about it. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Guys, uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Uh, it was extremely interesting, but I don't really have any questions. So. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, if uh, if no questions, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for, for truly amazing uh, presentation, truly amazing work. Uh, typically, our traditional question in the, in the end, uh, could you please share your most memorable uh, experience with uh, uh, with reviewing in the conferences? Uh, typically, people share the most annoying and all the most joyful. Yeah, what can you tell uh, on that? So, I think I had a we had a very uh, positive um, experience from uh, this uh, the reviewing of uh, ICLR. We, I think, we were lucky to have. Um, reviewers that were actually interested in our work. So they really, um, they basically, they asked a lot of questions. So there's some things that they didn't understand. They admitted maybe to not understanding them and asked for clarifications. And uh, once we gave them these clarifications, they they uh, gave us a, an appropriate score. So um, this time we had a very, very, we had a lot of luck in with our reviewers, which, yeah, were also relevant to our work and also were interested in it. So I basically, Basically, that's all you can ask for. Okay, I see. Then, yeah, then you're lucky because typically the experiences are, are not very pleasant for people. Okay, yes, yes, um, okay, cool. Uh, thank you, thank you, and uh, all the best uh, for your future research. We're looking forward to see new stuff. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I was very happy to be here.